and this population pressure was all around. So I, I, I realized at that point we couldn't even try to save the famous chimpanzees while the people living in the vicinity had less and less and would have their eyes on this area which to them they felt white people had taken this land away and were keeping them out of the last patch of rich soil where there still were trees. And so that led to a program that we called Takari. Take care, but we call it Takari. And it was a, a program initiated by a group of local Tanzanians. They weren't people who'd come from universities with high and mighty degrees. They were people who'd been employed often with uh, British programs or other European programs. They learned about uh, forestry and they were foresters. They learned about health and water. And we selected a team of them. They were the ones who went into the villages, not to tell the villagers what we were going to do to help them, although we had some good ideas, but to find out what the villagers thought would be good for them. And we started where the villagers wanted us to help with uh, growing more food, reclaiming overused farmland, and by the way, without chemical fertilizers, and uh, reforesting, re reforesting the steep valley slopes where the erosion was worst. They wanted better health facilities, so we worked with the local uh, government authority, and they wanted better education for their children. So we worked with the local education authority. The schools are unbelievable. You wouldn't believe them unless you saw them. You might have one of these rows here. If it was a bench, there might be 15 children squashed onto it. And you might have one teacher for a whole school. Of course they wanted uh, better education. And when it came to health, in some of these villages around Gombe, there was nothing. So we were able to persuade the local uh, medical people to come in and at least set up a little clinic and help to bring uh, some supplies in for that clinic. And so gradually, we were able to introduce other, other measures that we felt would be really useful, like protecting the water, the watersheds, so that it was helping to protect the streams, bringing in water projects. Most important of all, microcredit, based on the Grameen Bank, my friend Mohammed Yunus, and women, for the first time sometimes, could take out their own tiny loans, maybe buy a few chickens and sell the eggs, and then perhaps buy a few more with another loan. And we found that the groups of women pay back over 90% of the money that they borrowed. Been amazingly successful. Women are becoming empowered. And we also provide scholarships to keep girls in school because the boys get the chance when there isn't much money. And the reason this is so important is that all around the world, as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. And the uh, population growth in this part of Africa is the highest. It's a shocking population growth. So our program is beginning to mean that the people in the villages respect us, the Jane Goodall Institute and our Takari program. And we're now able to work with them laying out high resolution maps so that every village is required to plan the use of its land by the government. And they must put a certain amount aside for conservation. And so because they think we're good guys, they're sitting around and putting all of their village land around Gombe in a, so that it forms a buffer. Each one puts its 10% to help form this buffer. And then as we move out, we're now in 52 villages, so a leafy corridor is moving out towards other remnant chimpanzee groups. So we finally come around to the people having better lives, and this is now, as we hoped, helping the chimpanzees and the forest to be restored. So it's working. In fact, it's being held up as a model program of its kind by the European Union, and we hope to spread it. We already have a program similar in Uganda, 
another one in Democratic Republic of Congo, another in Congo, Brazzaville. And so this is, you know, really working to improve the lives of the people, which in turn is helping the survival, not only the chimpanzees, but also their own children. So it's a program that works. We've got a long way to go, but it, it is working. As I'm traveling around other parts of the world, I'm frequently meeting young people, high school students, university students, young people out in their first jobs, who seem not to have too much hope. And this is now going back to the late 80s, the early 90s, and I began talking to these young people, and they were, they were everywhere. They were in Africa, they were also in Europe, they were in North America, they were especially in Asia. And when I talked to them, they all said more or less the same thing, that they felt like that because they felt we had compromised their future and there was nothing they could do about it. You know, this morning I was talking to children and the children in the front row were quite young, maybe seven. And I was looking at them and thinking, how we have harmed the world since I was that age. And it's shocking. It's really shocking. But is it true when they say there's nothing we can do about it? That's where I think we can step in and start to turn things around. I do not think it's too late to turn things around. But it is a grim situation and we must realize what we have done. We must realize the extent of deforestation, the extent of desertification, the extent to which fresh water supplies are drying up around the world. That includes the great um, aquifers underneath the land. The ocean, you must know that here, the ocean is getting polluted. And what about in so many places the pollution of the air and the land and how it's drained down into the streams and then into the ocean? And the waste. And there are, I think, three, three huge problems that face us. And they all seem insoluble. But if we can't solve them, then for our great-great-grandchildren, the world is going to be a very grim place. And one of the problems is poverty, crippling poverty around the world. People who don't have one square meal a day. We all know about poverty but I don't think you have any first-hand experience in Albany. Those of you who've been overseas will know what I mean. And how do we solve this poverty? I think we've got the beginning of a way with our Takari program, but that is a drop in the ocean. And then we have the unsustainable lifestyle of so many people all around the planet. And then, overall, is the constant, gradual, and in some cases, explosive growth of the human population. We talked a lot earlier about similarities between humans and chimpanzees. But there is one major difference. There's a lot of small differences. To me, the biggest difference is the explosive development of the human intellect. And although chimpanzees can do things we never dreamed they could do and work computers and things, you can't compare a chimp intellect with a human intellect. You've only got to think of this machine that's taking photographs on Mars. I mean, isn't that amazing? I think it's incredible. So here's the difference. So the question is, how is it that the most intellectual creature that ever walked on the planet <coughs> is spoiling its own home, destroying its own home? No wonder the young people were angry or or um, apathetic, mostly apathetic, or really depressed. And so, in 1991, I started a program for young people, and initially, I have to, sorry, I have to get the water. <coughs> I've been talking too much today. <coughs> Three lots of children this morning, and now all of you. Anyway, so this program began with 12 high school students from nine different schools, sitting around 
talking about the problems they saw in the world around them, local problems, wanting me to do something about it. And I said, well, you know, I'm a foreigner in your country, so maybe you can do something about it. That was the, the little um, conversation we had all those years ago with those 12 high school students. And they went and got some of their friends, and we met again. And so the Roots and Shoots program was born. And it, was, it had a very simple message that every single one of us makes a difference <coughs> and some impact on the planet every single day. And you cannot live through a day and not make some kind of impact. And we have a choice. Some people have little choice. We have a choice. What we buy, what we wear, how we treat people, animals, and the environment, we have a choice. And so that's the main message of Roots and Shoots. From the start, we decided that a group should do three kinds of projects to make the world a better place. One to help people, one to help animals, including dogs, cats, cows, and so forth, and one to help the environment. And right from the beginning, it was conceived as something which might help to start breaking down the barriers that we build between people of different cultures, different religions, different nations, and between us and the natural world. So, Roots and Shoots was born, 12 high school students. And today, 131 countries, 16 or 17,000 active groups, members from preschool all the way through university with more and more adult groups being formed. We have here with us somewhere, Jasmina, you'll meet her if you come afterwards and want to learn more about the organization. And Jasmina is working for Roots and Shoots in the UK. This morning we had two groups from Orkney, the first two, and one was from, they came all the way from Papa Westray. And the other group, I'm not quite sure where, which island that is on. But anyway, it's, it's, it's begun and there was a lot of interest this morning and I hope there will be a lot of interest um, this evening as well. So, Roots and Shoots, I get my energy from this program because traveling 300 days a year, on the road 300 days a year, at my age can be pretty exhausting. Travel isn't fun these days. It used to be okay, but now early, there's all this wretched security, take your clothes off, hold your arms out, turn around, uh, let me prod and poke you in all sorts of indiscreet places. And, uh, well, you all know. Anyhow, so I get the energy, I think, from various cause and reasons, but especially the young people. Those three students from um, Papa Westray this morning, their eyes were shining. They were dying to tell Dr. Jane what they'd been doing, and they'd been doing a lot. And if we had a way of actually putting together, not just the activities that are done, the Roots and Tutes is about rolling up your sleeves and getting out there and doing, but if we could somehow find a way of assessing the impact on young people's minds and the way that they influence their parents or their grandparents, I can't begin to tell you how much this program is beginning to change. And we partner, we partner with other youth groups sharing a philosophy with us. And the goal is to have a critical mass of youth moving out to be the next parents and teachers, the next doctors and lawyers, the next legislators, the next politicians. And when you get a critical mass of people thinking slightly differently to the way things are done today, then you can begin to have hope for the future. At least, that's what I feel. So why is it called Roots and Shoots? It's called Roots and Shoots because, uh, imagine, well, see, you don't have that many trees. You have trees here and on your, around your house, and that's really nice. And I do believe that Orkney was once, the islands had trees on them, and they were cut down probably for shipping. And, you know, that's a perfect project for Roots and Shoots, putting back indigenous trees, growing up more trees, bringing up more forests. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm thinking of my favorite tree right now, which is a big English oak, and it's probably about a thousand years old. And when it began to grow, it came from a little acorn, a 
small acorn. And when that acorn started to germinate, little white roots appear and a little tiny shoot. And you can pick it up and it's so small and so weak, so easy to destroy. But there is a magical life force in that seed that is so powerful that those little roots to reach the water can work through rocks and eventually push them aside. And that little shoot to reach the sun can work through cracks in a brick wall and eventually knock it down. And if you think of the rocks and the walls as all the problems we humans have inflicted on the planet, social and environmental, it's hope, you see. Hundreds and thousands of young people around the world can break through and can make this a better world for all living things. And they are working as we speak. In some parts of the world, it's daytime. In China, the groups will be doing their projects. Um, so will they in, in North America and South America? So my reasons for hope for the future, and I give talks called Reason for Hope, and people always ask me, but Jane, you've seen so much that's gone wrong. Do you really have hope for the future? Well, I wouldn't stand up and say I did if I didn't. Um, because I couldn't do that because I would have no conviction. I would be lying and it would, you would know it. Um, I do think that we do have to take action faster than we are. I do think there will be a point of no return. But I don't think, as some biologists do, that it's as though we're on a big ship. You may not have trees, but you have lots of ships. And if you get a big ship and it's steaming full steam ahead and the lookout sees rocks ahead, and calls out danger, danger, and supposing everybody runs to help the captain turn the wheel, but the momentum of the forward movement is such there's going to be a shipwreck. And there are biologists who say that's what's happened with planet Earth. Maybe they're right, but I don't think so. I think we can uh, mitigate the damage at least. And climate change, of course, is one of the main things that we have to battle with. But if everybody does their bit, uh, we can surely make a difference. So it's the young people and what they're doing that gives me the most hope. But then we come on to this amazing intellect of ours, this extraordinary brain. And I've already mentioned the machine that's taking photographs in Mars. And it, it's really sad that this brain has been used to create weapons of mass destruction and and all the awful, awful things that we've done with our brain. But we are beginning to understand and there are more and more technologies out there to help us live in greater harmony with nature. And people are beginning to understand that what they do in their lives collectively will make a difference. So I asked a question earlier. The question was, how come the most intellectual being that's ever walked the planet is destroying its only home. I have to think there's been a disconnection between the clever, clever brain and the human heart, love and compassion. And we've lost wisdom. The wisdom where the indigenous people would only make a decision after asking how will this affect our people generations ahead. And we're saying, how will it affect me now or my next political campaign or the next shareholders meeting? and not thinking about the children. We love the children. We don't think about their future. We're thinking in the now. We've become so materialistic. And money, making money, making money, making money is becoming ever more important. And so, how do we heal the disconnect between the human brain and the human heart? I'm hoping that the young people will help to heal that. So the human brain, is a source of hope. And then there's the resilience of nature. You could bring forests back to Orkney, covering the peat and in, in helping to sequester the carbon dioxide that is one of the greenhouse gases that is leading to climate change. And I think you've probably all seen a place that was made pretty grim and ugly by humans, by human actions where nature has been given a chance, maybe some help, and it can once again become beautiful. And animals on the brink of extinct extinction can be given another chance. And I've, the, the, 
you know, it was such an amazing book for me to write because it got me speaking to biologists and just conservationists all around the world. Every single story in that book is inspirational because it's about a person or a little group of people who decided they would not let this particular species become extinct. And because of them, that species has another chance, whether it be a, an animal or a plant. And so it was very, very inspirational to write that book. And then finally, my last reason for hope is the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle seemingly impossible tasks, just like these people who are saving endangered species. Um, Well-known people like Nelson Mandela, who kept the quality of forgiveness even after his long imprisonment and led his nation out of the horrible, evil regime of apartheid. And people who we know all around us who are tackling these, people say, that's impossible, you can't do that. People who've uh, got some kind of physical disability, people who've had horrible misfortunes in their lives, and you think, how can they keep going? And yet they keep going, and they're inspiring to those around them. This little guy I'm carrying around with me, uh, this is Mr. H, uh, but he's Mr. H Jr. And Mr. H Sr. is 16 years old and has been around the world with me in 59 countries. And right now he's having a little operation because his head was coming off. <laughs> uh, the reason I've been carrying Mr. H around the world is because he was given to me by a man, Gary Horn, which is H, um, who went blind when he was 21, decided that he would become a magician, was told he couldn't be a good magician if he was blind, said he would try. It's so good that if he was standing here, you probably wouldn't notice he was blind. And he does shows for children, and at the end he'll tell them. And he'll say, you know, things may go wrong in your life, but if they do, don't give up. There's always a way forward. And he does that.